Um, good evening, uh, everyone, and good uh, morning, Claudia. Thank you for joining us from uh, the States and also from uh, Europe. I'm in Jerusalem uh, after two vaccination, vaccine shots. Uh, mm -hmm. Hope for, hopefully, you'll get them uh, as well soon. Uh, and today with us, uh, Professor Claudia R. Williamson. She is the ProBasco Distinguished Chair of Free Enterprise and Professor of Economics at the University of Tennessee at uh, Chattanooga. She also, uh, she's also the Director for Center of Econ Education, uh, Economic Education. Her main research interests lie in the intersection of applied economic development and political economy. Uh, what runs as a common thread throughout our work is combination of incentives and knowledge arguments revealing interesting and time unconventional results. A research, research focus, focuses on ev evaluating development policies such as foreign aid, uh, analyzing the causes and consequence, consequences of economic institutions and regulation, and understanding the role of culture in economic development. She currently serves as an editor for the prestigious uh, Journal of Institutional Economic, and she's on the editorial board of Public Choice and the Association of Private Enterprise Education Executive Committee. So welcome, uh, uh, Claudia, and um, we are happy to have you here. And I um, will just say the title of your work, and then you can uh, start or start from, from scratch, presenting uh, the work and its uh, context. Um, and this is a paper presentation on trust and business regulation across countries. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction and the invitation to join all of you. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. That's a while. Let me, let me allow you to do that. And now you can do it. Perfect. Let me get to it. Let's try that again. Excellent. It works. Okay. So when David asked me to present on some of the work that I've done um, analyzing trust. Um, I have just had a recent paper accepted and there, I think is a lot more to be done in this space of trying to understand the connections between trust and regulation. And so I'm going to present some work that um, has already been accepted for publication. But again, I think that what this does is it opens up the opportunity to have discussions about what else can we do. And I have some preliminary results of extending um, these connections between trying to understand um, how trust impacts the regulatory environment, but then also how trust impacts kind of efficiency and business outcomes broadly defined. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of give you an idea of some measures of regulation across countries. Most of us are probably familiar that regulation varies tremendously across countries, but sometimes when we see the numbers, it can still be quite surprising. So for example, um, to open a business in Georgia, it takes one day and one procedure. Basically, that means there's one step involved compared to Venezuela, where it would take over 230 days and over 200% of the income um, to construct a building. So think about whenever you're opening um, a business, if you would want a permanent structure, a structure to get those permits necessary to build that building, seven procedures in Denmark. Um, roughly say 30 days in South Korea to obtain the necessary permits, whereas in Cambodia, it's 650 days. To get electricity to that building or those structures it also varies tremendously. Um, as you can see in the United States, it takes 60 days, whereas in Liberia, 482 days. So it just starts to give you a sense of how much regulation is varying within not just um, say to open the business, which has been probably the most commonly used measure of the reg business regulatory environment um, to resolve debt, for example, again, tremendous, tremendously important to be able to do that and also a tremendous variation in the amount of time to do that. 
tending to register property. So when we think about the importance of property rights, um, one um, of the kind of main tenets that came out a lot of Hernando de Soto's work is that we need to be able to register property. And so then you could use this um, proper title to your property as collateral for a loan to then open a bank. And so again, we see tremendous variation across countries in the time and the number of procedures and the cost of being able to do that. Um, also, also look at trade regulation, meaning um, the number of documents, the amount of money that it would take in order to comply with all of the regulations surrounding importing and exporting. Um, as you can see in Iraq and Congo, um, to import, it's quite costly just to comply with the regulation. To enforce uh, contracts, which is going to be what a lot of the presentation will focus on today. We have a contract enforcement in Singapore is roughly 164 days, whereas in Greece it's over 1700. So you can imagine what that can do to how you would go about trying to do business if you know this going in basically to use a legal court system to enforce a contract is almost um, effectively impossible to do in Greece versus other countries like Singapore. Um, one other one that we will look at towards the end is going to be tax compliance, and that means the administrative burden. So not necessarily the amount of taxation that businesses have to face, but in order to actually pay your tax, what, um, how many payments a year do you have to make, for example, or how long does that take you to comply? So Hong Kong in this case would be relatively easy to comply with versus Venezuela, 999 payments over the course of one year, and that's over 900 hours to be able to um, meet that administrative cost and burden. This is also not going to be anything super surprising to us, but just kind of giving a quick summary of the literature on consequences of regulation. Lighter business entry regulation increases entrepreneurship, firm development, productivity, it cuts corruption. When we look at efficient contract environments, so again, the ease of being able to use a legal court to enforce your contract, you see higher um, or more developed credit markets. We have a better just overall business climate. You see larger firms. You can think about them in capturing economies of scale. It reduces the informal, that informal sector, fosters innovation, and promotes trade. Whenever we're able to resolve debt quicker, you see increases in liquidity. Again, not something that's surprising, but whenever we can actually put some numbers to this, it just is confirming some of our theoretical predictions. Higher cost of electricity connections leads to greater incidence of bribe payments, lower quality of electricity, and decreased firm performance. And then lastly, looking at higher corporate tax rates is gonna reduce overall aggregate investment. It reduces foreign direct investment, reduces entrepreneurship, and you see a larger informal economy. So just giving, again, kind of a quick summary snapshot picture here of what that entails is basically if you take the ease of doing business, so this is collected from the um, doing business work out of the World Bank. So just taking the overall aggregate ease of doing business score and then comparing that to income across countries, you see a very significant positive association between those two um, measures. So the most of the presentation will look at trust regulation and contracting institutions, and then we'll kind of broaden that to look at, is this association holding just between trust and contract regulation, or is it business regulation more broadly? And so this is some work co-authored with Brandon Klein at Mississippi State, and it was recently accepted, uh, or actually just published in 2020 at European Financial Management. And so partly why we decided to focus on contracting institutions initially is there's been so much work done, if you think about just lumping property rights and contract enforcement together on, from the theoretical side and empirical side to show the importance of property rights and contracting institutions. And so if contract enforcement is too costly, it's going to negatively impact credit, for example. If you have fewer judicial procedures to enforce a contract, you have more developed credit markets. Um, more efficiency in the judiciary to enforce a contract, that it's going to improve the overall business environment. You see reduction in the informal sector, fosters innovation, international trade, and economic growth. 
So basically then what we wanted to say is, okay, understanding that being able to enforce your contract is so important. It's very intuitive. That is not something that's shocking. And then we get the development of the literature that empirically shows that these um, being able to enforce your contract is so vital to the business environment. And then this, well, why is it that we see so much variation in regulation to enforce the contract? And so um, we'll take a kind of a quick second before getting into our um, theoretical arguments here of linking trust with contract enforcement is whenever we're talking about contract enforcement and the way that it's measured from the World Bank is they're looking at the number of procedures or the ability to use a legal court system. And so what we have to always kind of keep in mind or what are the rules surrounding that? And then, you know, the outcome side of things. So sometimes I think that can get a little bit confusing. So whenever we're saying contract enforcement, we're talking about the legal rules and the legal environment to use an official court to enforce your contract. And so given that what we were, um, uh, what we formulated was basically two hypotheses to try to understand this connection between trust and contracting efficiency by first looking at, well, what's the association between trust and contracting regulation? And so we first argue that in a trusting society or in a trusting environment, you're going to have less demand for regulation over the courts to basically enforce your contract. So in some sense, you can think that it's redundant or, or it's unnecessary. And then from that, we say, okay, um, you know, you could have a situation in which in a trusting society, you don't demand regulation, but you also don't get the positive outcomes from having courts that are more efficient at enforcing a contract. So it's kind of a two-step process where we say, well, we believe that trust is gonna reduce the demand for regulation, but trust is also then going to be able to promote um, and um, actually formulating contracts and those being upheld. And so just to kind of walk you through some of that logic there, um, and that decreasing the demand for contract regulation really build out I on et al's 2010 um, theoretical paper and then they have some is that Whenever society is concerned over opportunistic behavior, that's going to increase demand for government intervention. And so that also, the, um, a Laporta and a you know, series of co-authors has, has made similar arguments where you see when demand for government intervention in general, then that is largely because people fear specific to trust and regulation. And so in trusting societies, they argue that they don't fear private expropriation or they don't believe people on average are gonna behave opportunistically. So therefore they don't demand government oversight via regulation. And then they make a strong argument that that causation does run from trust to regulation, not regulation to trust. So in trusting societies, individuals might not then demand formal regulation because of this kind of theoretical underpinning to prevent others from reneging on their contracts. So on the flip side, when we live in a trust society, let's see your arguments come in. And so if you believe that you're constantly living in a state of market failure instead of market efficiency, then you may even and so they view government regulation as a necessary to promote cooperation and exchange. So as a result, we get distrust that's fueling support for government enforcement of contracts or government oversight of those courts. In other words, we're arguing that through distrust, you'll see more um, procedures or steps. It's going to be more costly to use a court system. So, population, even if that's activity, population or an additional step or procedure 
reduce potential exploitation by private intervention, even if that comes at reduced market activity. So then second step, so that's the trust regulation. And so in the presence of costly formal facilitating financial exchange formation and enforcement. So basically you're gonna use private means instead of government means in, the, in that case. So again, the biggest kind of um, argument here is to think about if, if you're trusting, you believe that most people are not gonna behave opportunistically and therefore you're willing to enter into contracts and willing to use other means besides a government court system to enforce that. So it could then therefore trust would be increase in the quality of the contracting environment. So just overall, if we think one thing about contracting institutions, very broadly speaking, contract formation, the, that they actually are enforced, um, we would argue that trust can increase the quality of that environment by encouraging contract formation and acting as an informal guarantee for that enforcement. Um, Pinochi extends the work of Agion et al. by demonstrating that trust predicts regulation, specifically business entry regulation, and that's the cause of economic inefficiency. And so within this paper, looking at um, and arguing that what is happening is that trust decreases business entry regulation, but then also whenever we look at predicting market failures, so um, in that paper it was shadow economy and pollution, that it's not that regulation is causing the market failure, it's whether or not we're dealing with a high trust or a low trust environment. And so we're basically going to use that logic and extend it to the contracting environment. So applying that, we would hypothesize that trust complements contracting institutions, again, broadly speaking, not just in terms of regulation, but the outcomes, basically, and that the effect of contracting regulation should be subsumed by trust. So that's kind of the broad overall predictions of what we're going to be trying to unpack. So then depending on the level of contracting regulation in the country, it's also possible that trust could be a substitute and a complement. And so this comes out of a Carlin et al. 2009 theoretical paper where they show that regulation and trust act as complements if the regulation basically facilitates the development of trust or the regulation isn't costly. So it's not a good regulation, bad regulation argument. It's what type of regulation. So sometimes regulation is um, facilitating market cooperation and exchange. So in that idea, then trust and the regulation can complement. But if the environment is, you know, overly burdensome, wh wherever that line might be, then trust could substitute. So if you have a high cost environment, so in some of the numbers we were going through an example, so say Venezuela. So if we're living in Venezuela, but you have um, trust among members, then you could overcome that overburden some regulation. So in that case, trust would be substituting. So it is a, a kind of an interactive uh, marginal argument. And that again, is what we're going to try to try to get at empirically and, and unpack. So to try to um, kind of understand then how we're going to test this, we distinguish between de jure contract regulation so that is where, again, we're relying on that, the doing business numbers in the sense of what is the number of procedures, the number of steps, how long does it take you to comply legally of using a court system to enforce your contract. So that's what we mean by de jure regulation versus de facto outcomes. So we can't really measure the in-between. In, in other words, um, it's hard to get at actual contract formation. So people are entering into contracts all the time. We don't really have a great way of capturing contract arrangements or contract formation. And so what we do to proxy for that is to look at outcomes. And so we're going to look at a, uh, you know, several different outcomes, one being shadow economy, for example, 
And so that is going to be the way that we're going to try to unpack this regulation and efficiency argument and how trust impacts both. So we would expect, given our theoretical arguments, a negative association between trust and contract regulation, but a positive direct link between trust and the de facto contracting outcomes. So going back to the data um, for our contracting regulation measure, we're going to look at the number of days to enforce a number of procedures. And so again, this is coming from the World Bank's doing business project. And we just use these two measures because we believe it gets more of those de jure legal requirements to use a court, a legal court system. And for example, you see a lot of variation here as well. Number of days to enforce, you know, varies from Singapore 120 days to Guatemala, which is almost 1500 days to try to enforce your contract in the government court. Number of procedures, which measures the total interactions to settle a dispute, um, also has a lot of variation. The US in this case had the lowest number of procedures compared to Iraq. And so what we do is we use principal component analysis to come up with an overall contract regulation index and a higher score would mean more regulation and Whenever we combine these two, we see that Singapore and US have the lowest scores compared to Egypt and Italy who have the highest scores. The indices, whenever um, I'll show you the regression analysis and even the figures are standardized. So they do have a mean of zero and a standard de deviation of one, just ease of comparison and interpretation. Our generalized trust measure comes from more world value surveys, the first six waves and uh, we use the question, the percentage of respondents stating that most people can be trusted, mean of 25%, a standard deviation of um, about 15.5%. Um, and we can see the Philippines, Trinidad, and Tobago are at the lowest in terms of generalized trust in Norway, which is probably not surprising. Norway and Sweden are at the top with um, most trusting societies. So whenever we combine these data sets, we come up with um, an unbalanced panel from 2000 to 20, uh, 2015, every four years, we um, have created a time period trying to match up these two databases and with 89 countries. And so to, to give you a kind of a picture view of what we're going to be um, looking at in, in the regression, regression analysis in a second, is that you can see as trust increases, the level of contracting regulation decreases. So this result holds up um, you know, through a variety of robustness tests, but you know, I think it's always nice to see the picture of it um, and to see where countries are kind of falling. And that just gives you just a you know, good image in your mind that as trust is going up, then we see um, fewer procedures, with fewer days to enforce a contract in a government court. Um, Claudia, I, I don't know if you want all questions kept to the end or, or if I can ask a clarifying question. Yes, absolutely. Um, you're going very fast. Um, so, and I need you to slow down and just be a little clear um, on how various things uh, interact with each other. Um, the idea of, uh, if you can go back to the last slide, uh, contract regulation could mean how much regulation there is. And so you're looking at the relationship between degrees of trust and how much regulation you should have. Um, I, I think a different idea is there is a certain amount of contract regulation, but the, you're talking about the level of activity, the level of enforcement, uh, trusting people to comply with rules that are already in place. And you, that's a different interaction. How much you trust people to comply will surely be uh, negatively correlated with the amount of intervention uh, required. Um, and you're, but you're also talking about the efficiency in running businesses and, and that could be partially affected, uh, not just by the level of regulation and not just by the, the, the level of compliance, but by how good a country or a regulatory agency is at organizing its processes, its registration, its applications. And it's court process. So, so, you know, a lot of gains could be made through simple process uh, re-engineering and, and improvement. 
um, you could help me uh, understand which of these three sort of different types of relationship you're really uh, focusing on or whether it's a little bit of, uh, of all of them. At this, um, so it's, it's somewhat of a combination in terms of what we're trying to understand, yeah. but for this particular graph and then the, the table that, was, that followed, what we're trying to do is just focus on um, kind of a combination of the first and the third thing that you said in the sense of the, the process. So mm -hmm. what do you have to do if, if I have a contract and my business partner is not upholding her end of the deal and I yeah. need to go to a court, yeah. what is that going to entail? And this is where we look at, well, look, we're going to measure the number of days it would take me to get it enforced, to get a resolution and the number of procedures. Right. And so in that sense, you're looking at the process, you're looking at the administrative burden. Yeah. And so more administrative burden, it's more costly. And so I'm either, you know, then incentivized to not enter into contracts or maybe this is where trust comes in, not use the court system, but rely on private means. And if we trust each other, if there's ways to signal that, then I may still enter into contracts and do business, but I'm, I'm ignoring basically the, the government means set, it, set up to enforce that contract. That's what we're trying to kind of unpack. But in this particular um, figure here, that's just saying, just trust, decrease the process, basically. So if you live in a country, so Norway, they have fewer steps and procedures to use their government court to enforce your contract. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll keep going, but please, please, especially if it's the, something like that, that helps to clarify. Um, uh, feel free to, to chime in. So to give you some, you know, just a quick um, summary, countries with more generalized trust have fewer regulations to enforce, enforce the commercial contract. So to give some economic um, significance, a 10 percentage point increase in trust is associated with approximately one less procedure and 38 fewer days. And this is again robust. Well, I'm not going to go through all those robustness checks that we did, but to political, economic, cultural controls, IV estimation, um, all the fun stuff. So here is basically the um, regression table of the of the figure we saw a few seconds ago with some of these um, pointer with some uh, other trust in there so we Just a couple of problems just in the you know individual measures looking at the number of procedures, number of days. And so what that's telling us is that a standard deviation increase in trust would reduce um, the number of days by about 8.6. And we would get 4.5% um, fewer procedures. And so um, looking at column three, an increase in standard deviation increase in trust would reduce the contract regulation index by about one fourth of, of a standard deviation there. When we look at those other measures of trust, family trust, personal trust, anonymous trust is the trust in strangers. Um, and then also confidence in your court system and confidence in government. It doesn't um, retract from looking at you know, the importance of generalized trust. So it's not that it's the generalized trust question from the World Value Survey has been criticized that what is that really measuring? And I think that's a valid point, but here whenever we're comparing it to other types of trust or confidence, it doesn't detract away from, um, it does really seem like generalized trust is um, doing the heavy lifting. So now, so we we kind of did that first part of you know understanding trust in the process, and now what we want to do is look at trust and contracting outcomes. So again, because we can't exactly measure 
the coming together and forming contracts, what we're trying to get at are proxies of if you have a good contracting environment, what are other things that we would then see? So one of the main measures of doing this, both from Agion and Ponochi, is to look at the size of the informal economy or, or shadow economy. And so that's one of our main um, contracting outcome measures. So if you have a healthy contracting environment, we would expect to see a smaller unofficial economy. If you have a healthy contracting environment, we would expect to see um, greater rule of law. So this measure comes from the worldwide governance indicators. And within that, if you read their definition, that's somewhat what they're trying to measure is the contracting environment. So we felt like this was also a good overall proxy of a contracting outcome. Then we take three measures from the World Economic Forum's Global Competitive, Competitiveness Index. We look at auditing quality, venture capital, and R&D expenditures. So somewhat of the argument here is that if you have good contracting and you, you enter into a contract and you expect it to be enforced, then you're more likely to enter into, for example, a risky contract, which was we would argue would be more fallen under venture capital, or you're more likely to invest. So you're just going to undertake riskier projects. Um, so you would see more R&D, you'd see more venture capital. Um, the argument with auditing quality is that, is that a healthy contracting environment and better auditing standards should correlate there as well. So summarizing um, these results, what we do is we're going to look at contract regulation, predicting outcomes. And so if we um, build from the prior literature, it was a decent body of work started again with Jankov and, and a series of co-authors who show that regulation is harming our environment, our business environment, our outcomes. Um, and again, they use, they use several different measures. Um, what Pinochet comes along and says, yeah, it's not really regulation, it's trust. And so if you just look at regulation and outcomes, we do see a negative association. When we include trust, that harmful effect is lessened but trust and the outcomes are positively related. So I'm gonna walk you through a series of tables kind of showing you those results. So taking our first um, contracting outcome, so the shadow economy measure, size of the informal economy, and the regulation index that we just, we just analyzed a second ago, so that's the same index. As regulation goes up, so as the number of procedures to use your court system. As the administrative or, or bureaucratic burden increases, you see a larger informal economy in that country. So they are positively related. So that follows again the prior work on kind of overburdens and regulation harming the economic environment. As we include trust, so this is the picture version of the regressions that are coming up. Um, this line, this significant positive association basically goes away. So this, the difference between the first and the second figure is that we've included trust now in the specification. And this is that partial correlation. And now there, that's basically an insignificant association. But the last thing that we kind of need, the last piece of this puzzle to make this argument that trust is substituting for an overburdened and contract regulation environment, we need trust to be significantly decreasing the size of the informal economy, which is what we find. So it's the trust is really doing the heavy lifting. So putting this in regression form, um, kind of that first step of just looking at regulation and outcome. So we see more bureaucracy, um, more sh higher shadow economy, um, less venture capital, less R&D. It's a negative association between rule of law and auditing quality, but not statistically significant. And then once we include trust, those um, negative significant effects goes away, except on R&D. But um, perhaps more importantly for us and the argument that we're trying to understand or make here is that trust is significantly associated with the signs we would expect if trust is doing kind of the substitution. So 
For example, trust increases rule of law. It increases our you know, auditing standards, all auditing quality, venture capital, and R&D. So countries that have more trust, you see um, a smaller informal economy and kind of better outcomes on these other margins. We do IV estimation. So uh, anytime you do cross-country work, um, most empirical estimations are going to suffer from endogeneity. One way of trying to come at this, it's not perfect, but uh, is to do IV estimation. We draw from the literature to use what is uh, known as pronoun drop. So basically it codes language and if it is permissible for you to drop the pronoun. There's lots of different arguments kind of surrounding how the, the way that we speak would also impact our culture. And so the argument here is that in cultures that tend to um, permit pronoun drop, you see more kind of collectivist or in-group, out-group attitudes, which could decrease generalized trust. At least that's the argument that we make, and it does seem to show up empirically. Those are our first stage results um, here. And then um, the second instrument that we use is genetic distance from Norway, since that's our most trusting country in our sample. Again, there's a decent body of work that argues that um, the more genetically similar you are historically from your ancestors, the more culturally similar you are. So same thing here, if you're genetically similar to Norway, you may also have more generalized trust in your country. And so our first stage results are pretty good. And then so the second stage results, again, using those five contracting outcomes, we see that um, for the most part, they hold up at a statistical significance of 5% or better, except with auditing quality, it's been reduced. Again, um, somewhat important to that story or supporting the work of Pinoche, what was found in, in the 2012 paper is that Regulation is basically insignificant. We have a 10% significance with R&D expenditure, but overall the way that we're going to interpret this is to say we're trying to understand the contracting environment, just the overall what's going on, the efficiency of contracting in a country. If you have a burdensome, bureau, high bureaucracy, reg, uh, regulatory environment that you're facing, but you have trust, then, that, then the uh, regulatory environment is not really harming you. So that, that this is where we're picking up kind of the, what we're arguing is the substitution effect here. And so to extend that, to try to get a better understanding, we're going to do some interaction effects. Uh, also still using our instruments, so still with um, a two-stage model. And so our interaction effects here show that trust, even independent effect, um, is still pretty significant. Contract is not, the regulation does not have an independent effect. Our interaction term is insignificant, but really what's important is that we understand the marginal effects. So that's what's up on the next slide. So here what we show is that the marginal effects of trust conditional on different levels of regulation. So panel B here this is really, I think, um, where the story kind of comes together for us. So if you're at, say, the 25th percentile of regulation, so that would be a low regulatory country, so the United States, for example, Singapore, then you see um, that trust is highly significant. So that, to us, is supporting that Carlin argument, which was that if you have you know, not an overly burdensome bureaucratic regulatory process, trust can complement. So trust is still working in the same way we expected in the uh, regressions we saw earlier. But now, if you are in a low regulatory country, it's, um, you know, that result's still there. As regulation increases, so we go from the 25th percentile to the mean to the 75th percentile, so now we're up to a higher regulatory country. Then trust is, in this sense, somewhat more important. So our statistical significance starts to decline somewhat. Our stars are going down, but the size of the coefficient goes up. And so we 
use this as somewhat supporting that Carlin theoretical argument that trust can actually complement or substitute. It just depends on which part of the spectrum are you falling in, how burdensome is the regulatory environment. And so we think that this, this result right here is interesting because it does somewhat support that, uh, that trust can be both complementing and substituting depending on the level of regulation. Here in panel C, what we do is we just do the marginal effects of regulation at different levels of trust. So maybe, right, so the argument and why we tested this is, well, maybe in a really low trust environment, so if we go back to the theoretical arguments from Agion, for example, People in a low trust country believe that others are going to behave opportunistically, therefore they demand government oversight. Well, maybe in a low trust country that would have been kind of a constrained optimization. So that's why we tested these marginal effects here. But we don't see that. We don't see that um, here. This would be a low, low trust country that if you um, have average level of contract regulation, that it's helpful. And it's not statistically significant. It's not helping. It's not hurting. So to us, that also kind of speaks to the Pinochet um, argument that really what's mattering for the efficiency of um, your market environment is trust. And once you include trust in the analysis, the prior negative effects that have been documented in the literature, basically, we're not finding that anymore. So it's not a, a, a situation in which, oh, trust doesn't, or regulation doesn't matter, it's we need to be including trust in this conversation and argument to get the full picture. And then um, quickly, because it's supporting um, this same story, is that we do, so with IV estimation, we just split the sample into the low regulatory countries and the high regulatory countries, basically find a similar argument, um, more supportive of the substitution here um, so this is where we have low regulatory countries um, and trust in this case would be complementing. So again, trust is doing a lot of work still even in the low regulatory environments. So again, we could, we could imagine making an argument that, okay, perhaps in the United States, it doesn't matter if we have trust because we have a decent court system to enforce contracts. And what this is saying is actually it still matters. It's still, um, complements that environment. It still reduces, further reduces the shadow economy. It further enhances rule of law. We get even more R&D and venture capital. In the high regulatory um, subsample, we see that it still matters, but less so in the sense that it, um, our two measures with shadow economy and rule of law are the only ones that are statistically significant here. But there, I mean, there's different arguments as to why that may or may not be the case compared to those interaction results. So kind of the, the, the overarching same story, um, trust seems to be substituting at least for example, and that it would be reducing the size of the shadow economy and increasing rule of law. But perhaps with R&D expenditure, if um, you're at a situation in, uh, in, or in a country which is highly regulatory, Trust may not be enough to overcome that. So that's kind of how we interpreted these set of results. Can you say which of the uh, high regulatory countries? Uh, you said the US was low. The US is low. So um, we can look back at our pictures here. Um, so this is our contracting index. So the low regulatory countries, we have US and Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong, Guatemala um, is, is up here. So this would be high regulatory countries. Italy, Italy is, is um, does not have an efficient court system. Trinidad and Tobago, Egypt, here's the Philippines, um, Slovenia, Algeria, Pakistan. Philippines are, is here, Peru. So that, that kind of gives you a good sense of, of where certain countries are falling. So just to summarize this set of results, 
trust negatively predicts the number of procedures and the number of days to reach contract resolution. So that's again, using the court system to enforce your contract. Now, what we know is that um, there are private means and that's what we think we're picking up on. We think we're picking that up because of that second set of results, which is that trust positively and significantly relates to de facto contracting outcomes. So if they're not using the court system, but we have contracting taking place, then there has to be some sort of substitution taking place. And we think trust is facilitating that. So in, including trust and contracting regulations simultaneously reveals that the coefficients on contracting regulation are attenuated. And that this collectively suggests that trust can promote a positive contract environment and substitute for a costly formal regulatory environment. What we found, I think, somewhat interesting, and we tried to make this, maybe not oversell it, but try to make this point is that um, oftentimes in the literature, whenever we're talking about property rights or contracting institutions, we think, well, it's the legal system. So you have to have a high quality legal system or you can't have secure property rights. You can't and won't see contract formation. And we kind of pushed back on this. So there was an awesome Ogler and Johnson 2005 paper. There's a quote from there that's basically suggesting that. Whereas we think, well, you know, if your court system isn't so great, that doesn't mean that there aren't alternatives. And so we think that then that's where trust can kind of fill that gap. And that trust is a very important component of efficient contracting. We see that trust is not only explaining the level of regula regulation over the judicial system, but kind of the difference in contracting efficiency across countries. And so kind of combining all of that, we think this is telling us that regulation is not the root cause of contracting inefficiency, but that really it's about we need to understand um, trust. And then whenever you are in a trusting environment or you are trusting individuals, that does alter your behavior. And that is what's really explaining um, kind of inefficient, inefficient contracting across countries. And so that's just, you know, kind of a quick overview of the, the paper that we recently had published. But now what I wanted to do is to try to come back and say, okay, is this just with contracting? So the um, Aguillon and Pinochet paper, they look at business entry. So if we think about all the different types of, of regulation that businesses have to face, we're really only touching on a couple. And so I wanted to expand this to the other business regulations. And so we're still going to draw from the doing business um, project to get our measures of regulation, but there's no reason that we can't try to try to see if there's maybe it's just um, trust really just matters for contracting or trust really just matters whether or not you would open a business. And so um, I do have some preliminary results extending this. But before kind of um, going in that direction, I want to maybe go ahead and stop to see if anybody does have any specific questions on contracting or the contracting environment or outcomes or anything like that. Okay, well, we can definitely um, ask questions um, continuing throughout or, or, or at the end. May I um, ask a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, from a lawyer perspective, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and uh, it seems to me that you uh, treat contracts as something which is given, let's say it's X. But uh, to tell you a story, uh, a friend of mine, I, I am uh, all my life I'm at the university, but a friend of mine, 20 years ago or so, he had to, to he was a, he's a tax lawyer and he had to do a, a merger with a small UK business. And he said, well, after, after a day, we, we agreed on it. Everything was okay, so we could go home. But no, the UK business brought the lawyers in and then of course the pizzas and they had to go on for a night and, and, and another day. And then in the end, he said, we got a contract 
it was like an encyclopedia. <laughs> so, so isn't, let's say that the contract itself could be maybe something to, to, to handle this trust, um, but couldn't be that also a factor that if you spell everything out in your contract, uh, well, you, you don't need to go to court because everything is spelled out. Other, the, the other way around, he said, well, maybe the, the Netherlands is more principles based uh, than UK and maybe US is more rule based. And if you're more principle based, well, you, you accept that you leave things open. And then of course, well, you, you come back to each other and, and you just discuss it. So maybe let's say it would, could be interesting to, to look a bit into this idea of a contract itself, uh, the contracting cultures. So those are excellent, excellent points. And I agree with you. And part of the constraint on your first point is um, trying to tell the story with the data that you have to be able to back that up. And so how I interpret kind of your first comment is about the actual formation of the contract. And I don't think that we have great your understanding of that or great ways of, of empirically trying to proxy for that. Um, I think the most work that's been done is in the experimental literature where they you know, bring people together to try to see, well, how do they, when do they, when they formulate a, a formal contractor, you know, try to, trying to understand somewhat of this story you were telling, when does that happen that maybe it's just, you know, two sentences or maybe it's um, 2000 pages. So part of our constraint was exactly what you were describing in that we can't really say anything about the actual contract or when, when people even come together to put it on paper. So we know more after that. So you've entered into a formal contract and now it needs enforced. And so that's, we're picking up that part and that part of the story and then, and then trying to, to understand how trust would impact the use of courts to enforce or, or not to use the courts to enforce. The formation aspect is fascinating. And I hope that um, to be able to, to try to understand that and be able to maybe find some way of proxying for it across countries and to get a better picture of that. Your second point is speaks to the whole um, incomplete contracting literature, which is critical in understanding this. And we did not push this um, line of reasoning too much in the paper, but we think what's happening is somewhat of a pushback because if you think about um, incomplete contracting literature, anytime they talk about trust, it's more of, well, if you just, you know, it's, it's necessary because you can't literally write everything down, but it's more of like an afterthought. Um, and so, you know, so a lot of it's just trying to understand the uh, constraints on trying to, you know, to write as complete of a contract as you can. And then if you don't have a complete contract and you start going through the legal procedures, what happens? And so we think that trust plays a bigger role in the incomplete contracting space and that we're just starting to maybe um, speak to that a little bit. But I completely agree with you that both are important to try to understand more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I suggest, uh, Claudius, that you will continue. Um, it's fascinating and uh, I'm eager to see the extension. Okay, great, thank you. So not too much and it's not gonna be too surprising. I'll give you the heads up. It's very similar to the um, findings that we had with contracting, but we will expand it to measure, and again, opening a new business was it was the um, business entry regulation was what the two main papers, Agion et al. and, and Pinochet used as their measure of regulation. So we'll re-examine that. We'll re-examine the contract um, to enforce the contract. And then the other ones are, that at least to my knowledge are new, the others have not examined the number of procedures, time, or costs to register property, to trade across borders, to obtain construction permits, to obtain electricity, resolve 
debt, and then the administrative burden to pay your taxes. And so again, just to back up um, to try to get your head around all of these indices, basically what it's doing is it's measuring that bureaucratic cost. It's the burden of an entrepreneur, but the burden that an entrepreneur would have to face to legally open and now operate a business. So when you think about trying to operate a business, you need to be able to legally open it, to register it, perhaps trade your good across countries. You would need to be able to probably build a building, get electricity, and then at some point resolve debt. And of course you would, again, if you're trying to operate legally, need to pay your taxes. And so this, these measures again are, are measuring that administrative or the bureaucratic burden to legally operate a business. And there's basically eight different measures we're gonna look at now. Um, we use principal component analysis because within each area, doing business reports number of procedures, time, and cost. And a couple of them, I don't think they have number of procedures, so that's just not available. But we would basically take those three um, and combine it into an overall business entry regulatory index or you know registering property index. And then I also um, just will combine them all into just an the overall regulatory environment. And so this gives us um, just a super basic um, univariate regression with trust and all of those measures of regulation. And so I actually found, I was somewhat surprised in the sense that it trust maintained that negative and significant association with all measures. It makes um, you know, sense maybe just because of what we've been seeing in the literature that it would decrease on business entry regulation, um, the, but prior work I've done on, on court is basically the same measure of the contract regulation there. Uh, but it also uh, decreases you know, the number of steps and procedures to register your property or to trade across borders to you know, get your construction permits, to get electricity, to resolve debt, and to pay your taxes. And so if you look at the overall regulation index of so that last column, what that tells us is that a one standard deviation increase in trust would decrease the overall regulatory burden by a half standard deviation. And so that's quite large. Um, and so we think that there's something here to, to expand upon and say, you know, it's not just about the contracting environment or it's not just about starting a business, but we tend to see that all of these are, are associated in the sense of um, trust is generally decreasing the demand for government intervention in the business environment. And then building off of that, we'll um, just look at, uh, we can, once we add our controls in, the significant stays except for trade. And so we can add in legal origin it is, you know, from the Laporta et al. work, an important predictor of regulation, population, income, so even adding in some basic controls for the most part, our association is staying the same. And so then if we wanna to try to understand, well then is trust substituting for an overly burdensome regulatory in, environment? We'll look at, um, I just do shadow economy. So before for the contracting environment, we were able to pull in other proxies of what we thought would be good outcome measures for contracting. Here we just look at the shadow economy. So again, the arguments, more regulation, you're gonna drive people underground or into black markets. And so we'll include trust and we'll include all of those um, different measures of regulation. And we have the same pattern that we saw, um, that we saw with the contracting paper. And so here, so if we're just predicting the shadow economy, trust is negative and significant. And we're including um, here all the different measures of regulation and none of them are significant. And this is a you know, basic OLS, we do have our, our controls in there, but it's still informative. It's still interesting that um, the, the kind of the results found in the prior paper is holding when we're even looking at the other measures of, of regulation. So it does seem to be more of a general 
um, kind of theoretical and empirical result, and that's not just specific to contracting or new business formation, for example. And then we I do a, a just a, some quick um, IV estimations. I use different instruments in the in in this part. Partly, I believe it's they're more theoretically sound. Um, and then we got a few more, I got like five or six more observations. And as you, as you can see, we're, we're getting on the lower end of number, a number of observations. Is here are the most, we have 78 countries. So I felt like those five or six additions would be important. So um, just real quick to go through the theoretical arguments as to why these can instrument for, um, instrument for trust is, there's a couple theoretical papers that look at historical rainfall variation. And the idea there is that if you have a lot of variation in your rainfall, then what you had to do was basically pull your risk and that created stronger bonds. And so it created more trust among members. And so places historically that had a lot of rainfall variation tend to have higher levels of trust. And so that's what we see in, in this basic setup here. And then the second instrument is the historical prevalence of um, infectious disease. Somewhat interesting to read that literature right now to see how whenever you have uh, high levels of infectious disease, how that affects um, not just your economic conditions, but you have long lasting effects on your culture. And so here the argument is that it creates um, kind of xenophobic attitudes toward outsiders. You're very skeptical of strangers, especially historically when there was less understanding of um, disease, that you know, kind of understand how disease spread, germ theory. And so what this does is it creates less trust among people. So if you see a bunch of people around you getting sick and dying, it's created an environment of, of being less trusting. And so both of these um, instruments seem to work well and in these specifications and um, moving to the to the second stage result, it somewhat mimics that um, the OLS, with the exception of construction. So construct the construction regulation is insignificantly now related to trust, but the other seven and the overall index, what we still find is that trust is reducing those number of regulations, and the um, or trust sorry is reducing the, the shadow economy. And the number of regulations is, for the most part, insignificantly associated um, with the shadow economy. For business entry, we now pick up um, some statistical significance. And for trade, we see st statistical significance. So in that case, for example, what this means is if it's harder for you to trade across borders, meaning you have a lot of compliance with paperwork, it's costly for you to do that. It takes you a long time to comply. Um, then you see um a larger informal economy so it kind of fits what we would anticipate or our, our intuition but for the most part we're still seeing that trust is substituting for the regulation and that trust is really driving the outcome we don't see as much of the negative from an overburdensome regulatory regime impacting the efficiency of the market. Again, we have some sign significance with trade and business entry, but overall, it doesn't seem to be the driving factor, whereas trust really seems to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting. We, I also do this with subsamples. And so similar to before, in a low regulatory environment, so again, think something like the United States, Hong Kong, Singapore, we see that trust is highly significant and statistically and economically significant. So trust is reducing the size of the informal economy in low regulatory regimes. And in high regulatory regimes, it doesn't have any significant effect in this set of results. So what that means, again, to some interpretation of that would fall along the lines of at some point, you know, the informal means can't completely substitute when the government's creating such a bureaucratic cost on businesses. So there's some kind of in-between 
um, and up to basically think of it up to a certain point, we would argue that maybe trust can substitute. So you can use your private means, you can rely on your networks, and you can, um, you're able and capable of figuring out how to get things done. But at a certain point, that regulation is going to start causing harm. And so um, I think kind of figuring out next steps would be try to figure out, well, at what point, when, you know, can you see this, the complement? Then, then it can substitute, and then basically the, the burden is just too much. And so just to overall summarize, it does seem that trust appears to decrease demand for all forms of business regulation, not just business entry or contract regulation, and it promotes an efficient business environment. Once trust is included in the speci specifications with regulation, regulation for the most part is no longer leading to worse outcomes. And so similar to some of the prior results, it is, seems to be extending to other aspects of business regulation. And so that's um, all of the, the formal part of the presentation I had. So we can open it up for discussion. <laughs> uh, I had a question, but I think Tony Prosser was ahead of me. He wrote in the right. chat. Okay, yes. Tony? Yeah. Just unmuting. Um, okay, uh, before my question, on the point that was raised in the previous contribution about different types of contracts, there's a huge literature on this, um, on relational contracting. Um, sorry, but can you, can you still hear me? I'm getting yes, few... yes, we can see you and hear you. Relational contracting. Um, Ian McNeil, uh, I think I've gone. No, 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 you're, 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 oh, right, sorry, my, my screen's gone blank and I can't see anybody, but I'll just talk. Um, well, Ian McNeil's work um, is central to that, um, and it's fascinating work it is too. Um, I would like to push you a bit on your um, normative underpinnings here, because I was thinking here, um, what is the, the basic normative point you're making? And at first I thought it was um, against regulation. Um, you use the phrase burdensome regulation quite a lot. Um, I then thought it was moving to something slightly different, which was in favor of predictable, stable regulation, which contracts might be able to give us if they work properly. Um, and then it moved, I think, um, to talking about efficiency as the basis for regulation. Now, efficiency can mean a number of different things, of course, um, but I've written work for many years suggesting that regulation is not essentially um, based on the norm of efficiency. It's based on a, a set of different norms, which can include issues like protecting human rights, social solidarity, social rationales for regulation. Now, it seems to me that if you take that approach, um, you're talking about a very different version of trust, not trust based on contracts on instability, but trust based on learning, responsiveness, openness. Um, that didn't really figure in your analysis at all. Um, and I wonder um, how you would cope with suggestions that what you might call burdensome regulation is in fact very desirable regulation. It's based on protecting human rights, etc. We've got a very important case um, relating to this in the UK at the moment about fire safety, um, which resulted in a major disaster. Um, how would you balance those things? Um, can contracting do that job or do we need other types of procedures? Okay, that, that was my question. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I think that's great. I, I think there's several ways of approaching it. I, I don't necessarily disagree in the sense that what we're discussing is at odds with that. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of back up and give maybe what I consider the, the flow of the literature that we're building from. And so in the early 2000s, um, Jankov and a series of others working at the World Bank started um, trying to measure cross country levels of regulation. And what they did in those papers is they also showed 
that more regulation. So again, they're measuring it as procedures, days, time. The way they set it up, if you, if you will, is costly. If, we, if it takes you longer to do something, that's higher cost, whatever that might be. So that's just there. And that's the way that, the, that most of this is measured. And so when you have something that's higher cost, then you see that it's a bad. And what I mean by that is they then empirically document more regulation shows um, overall reductions in income, reductions in growth. So kind of a broad, broad level, right? We're still at, a, we're, in some sense, we're at a high aggregate level. And so then we start, whenever we're starting to try to want to unpack this a little bit more, was to say, first, why do we get regulation like that? If it's burdensome, and then and that is somewhat of, a, uh, I think, an important question that we all need to keep asking, why is it, does it exist? And so that's kind of where we went to a trust theory. But I don't think that the type of regulation that you're talking about is necessarily at odds with that, because you can have regulation that enhances market outcomes. And so if fire safety regulation creates um, more market activity long run, then that's different than the way that the theory was built because of the way in some sense that the regulation is measured. And so that's maybe just meaning that's a bad way of um, writing this theoretically because it needs to be more encompassing, not just bad regulation, therefore trust can substitute. It needs to be, okay, well, regulation covers a lot. And so now let's be a little bit, or be more clear. And that's the type of regulation we are trying. The way that we measure it is as it goes up, it would be a cost. It's not promoting market activity. And that is what is documented empirically. So I hope that helps. If not a- Well, thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for the- um, suggestions on, on the work and other things to look at. I think the role of trust um, does turn out to be different in the field of uh, you know, economic market efficiency regulation where everyone participating in the market benefits if it works efficiently from Tony's concerns, which are more to do with social regulation where public interests are defended by control on private um, uh, business activity and I, th I think trust is different in these two environments because uh, you normally trust people when their interests are aligned uh, with yours um, that's the reason to trust them or they're aligned with the public purpose or the common good or whatever you it is that you think social regulation is about um, so I think teasing those two apart yeah. is actually very important work um, to be done here. I had, a, I had a, a, a much shorter and I don't know whether it's a simpler question. Um, if we accept all of your findings and recognize trust is a good thing, markets work better, there's less lead, less need for burdens and regulation, which, which all sounds perfectly right. Um, what's the policy consequence? Um, is there a lever called trust that anyone can move? Um, or is this merely uh, diagnostic and observational, but with no policy consequence. Um, I think uh, that's an excellent point. I get this quite a bit because I tend to increase it. it. Yeah, yeah. In in culture, not just with trust, but my other papers look at other aspects of culture. So I get this all the time. So that's great. So you document this, but now what? <laughs> so I don't think, especially with trust. I don't think it's a, oh, there's nothing we can do type thing. I think there's a couple things to consider within policy. One is it is important, I would argue, for policy makers to recognize this. So if they're trying to figure out a way to create more efficient regulation, however we would define that, um, trying to decrease the administrative burden would be, I would still argue, relatively an important step. But at the same time, maybe not as important if, if there are alternatives. 
And so again, from a policy perspective, we can think about um, not so much to manipulate trust, but things that perhaps don't promote social bonding or capital for social capital formation. And so that's where I think it actually probably speaks to. And there's a, a lot of work within that, you know, social capital literature that has suggestions, but I think it's kind of scary. Maybe it's just the world we're living in at the moment. The thing about policymakers trying to do something to encourage or manipulate that or something like that. But again, I think it's more of like a like a check on policymakers of culture matters or trust matters. And within relating that to regulation, the only thing that we have our fingers on is to not make things more costly or more burdensome. Um, I think it's but, but just, you can imagine um, a slightly it may be perverse, but um, you could say, well, in order to increase trust between players in the market, let's make sure there's a really omnipresent and heavy handed regulatory environment. Um, and then the deterrence factor will work for you and they'll, they'll be more likely to trust each other. Just as you know, I, I walk down the street and I trust other people not to attack me or rob me um, if I know there's a decent law enforcement regime operating. Uh, if there were no police department at all, I'd think twice. Um, so so, so <laughs> uh, the trade the, the trade off that your analysis finds um, yeah. could could lead you to say, well, stronger regulatory environment, more trust will spring forth so because that, we want less regulatory action. That's great. So that was part of the um, kind of theoretical papers. And mm -hmm. my part of my tackle, what takeaway from that is it depends on where your starting point is. So maybe in a country like the United States, um, increasing the oversight from government is not going to have much of a marginal benefit because we're in, already in a relatively high trusting society. Whether how we got there, maybe we got there because of the state, but however we got there, this is where we are. If we try to increase it at the margin we're not gonna see as much payoff. But perhaps in um, countries with low trust, that's when um, the theoretical predictions were, well, government technically could increase the overall outcomes. Not necessarily that they would be increasing the trust level, but the substitution would move, okay, you're not, you don't trust each other, so we can't rely on private means, so we need more government means. So that's definitely your, your your argument's definitely aligned with what we're trying to figure out, I guess, in this part of the literature. And I don't have a great, um, I don't have a great sense in terms of trying to provide a, you know, strong policy recommendation outside of it. I guess it just makes me nervous when we think about if there is trying to be manipulation in terms of culture or trust and, and that maybe can get just, there needs to be caution there, but that's probably just my my normative worry, <laughs> more than directly from the outcome of the paper. Yeah, more more questions. Um, um, if, if not, I, I, let me say that uh, I think what you are trying to do conceptually uh, is uh, fascinating. Thinking about the different connections between trust and regulation, and this is something that I, I would be trying to to do. Uh, following you and others um, in the coming two months uh, I have to produce a paper. So the interaction and what you did here was very, very useful for me. Um, and I, actually I encourage you and others to, to, to be in touch on, on those uh, issues. Um, so this is, this is one, I have a minor question regarding the data, why not to do this kind of exercise? in the US uh, uh, at the state level, uh, mm. probably because the, da the data is better. Uh, and also thinking about different regulatory regimes in different sectors like telecommunications uh, versus uh, say uh, food safety. Uh, and then think about those relations, uh, mm. sorry. And then the final one, and, uh, and I'm not sure you have the time to connect, to connect, what does it mean to political economy theory? Uh, 
because you are placed in the political economy literature and the implication of and putting trust in the center of political economy, maybe do it socioeconomic, so socio, socio you're moving in the direction of socioeconomic uh, rather than political economy. Um, and a different type of uh, literature and question and so on. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I never really thought it was so, to the last point about uh, trust in the political economy literature. I Maybe it was just uh, in grad schools, the papers that we were assigned it, were more open to that. So my influence is maybe a little bit um, not as traditional as, as a political economy class would it would have been, but you know we started trying to understand um, situations, outcomes, history. Whenever you have a state, when you have different types of states, and when you don't have a state, and so through reading a lot of the anarchy literature, that's where we would see well the importance of trust. So, you know, the, some of the anarchy literature shows, well, you know, you would think given the way of, you know, Hobbesian prediction, um, but then whenever you look at cases in history, you don't really necessarily see life being nasty, brutish, and short without a state. And so why? And so that's where we, you know, the arguments pulled in trust or there's just alternative means to signal the type of agent that you are and to get people to trust you learn their language, learn their culture, you mimic them, you marry your daughter into the other person's family, right? So there's a, there's a lot of ways to do that. And basically that's building trust over time. And that to me naturally fit in to what I would call political economy, but maybe um, it was just my influence more than um, correctly assigning it to that. Um, but I think that your suggestions on understanding and trying to incorporate um, within the US is great. There would probably be a lot of different data we can pull from and probably start addressing some of your guys' other comments. And then by industry. So I didn't think about the way of classifying different types of regulation um, in the way that you guys put it, but I think that's great to think, you know, if we're even just looking at what I'm just calling this narrow set of business regulation. But if we do compare it to, if we want to call it social regulations, regulations and rules, requirements that are even put on businesses to behave a certain way, not with the intention of increasing market activity, with the intention of not harming citizens, you can probably then recategorize. And I wonder how trust would affect those different types of categories. And I think that's an excellent suggestion. So thank you for that. I want last tiny suggestion. If you if you stick with the economic uh, efficiency um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, issues and stick at the country level um, for your data, because that's mostly what you have, um, you might want to look at the effect of religion, um, because uh, religion could act as a substitute for a common shared religion. Um, that's right. Uh, could act as a substitute for a government um, intervention, that there are high levels of shared expectations about moral conduct, uh, wherever they come from. I, although I, I, although thinking through the countries uh, that, that are outliers, I, I think you'd find Scandinavia was weird, um, <laughs> on, because I think it's uh, probably more um, agnostic or atheistic. Um, and some of the other countries, though, were powerfully Catholic. Um, or powerfully Muslim, um, and I suspect that um, uh, contracts would generally work better in those environments. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Or ethnic relations uh, across countries, yeah. uh, or ethnic comp compositions yeah. uh, across countries. But uh, this is more poli the political, but uh, the, the, yeah. So one last uh, thing before we, we finish, uh, because we are over time, is uh, some, it came to me that the idea that we need uh, a ministry of trust, like the ministry of happiness. <laughs> or, or, and loneliness. <laughs> trust is so important. But uh, let's... Uh, well, the Taliban has one. Uh, they have, a, what is it called? Um, happiness. The, 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 
ministry uh, of, of moral morality. You know? I think it will. Oh, yeah, this yeah. goes in the direction of religion more, sounds yeah. more religious. Uh, one True. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. Thank you very much, uh, Melko. Thank you. And uh, all others, um, it was excellent uh, presentation, and I'm sure there will be a lot of audience and a lot of attention to this talk uh, and citation to your work uh, uh, when we put it online. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you bye so bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye.